Hello and welcome to a very special movie review episode of Tony the Movie Guy. This one is on Blade Runner 2049 and I'll let you get right to it. It is amazing. Enjoy. Hello everyone, this is Tony the Movie Guy. Uh, this is a special episode, um, just because I am a total nerd and uh, I wanted to get this out to you as soon as possible since I just saw Blade Runner 2049 and I wanted to give my review on it. Um, I'm not doing this episode today with uh, Miss Money Any, um, but don't worry, I got her permission. God bless her. She hasn't seen the movie yet, uh, like a crazy person, I saw it on opening night. And then I saw Blade Runner, the original one, again. And then tonight, I dragged my lovely wife out with me to uh, see it a second time. So uh, just to give me some uh, support and comfort, uh, the producer and my wife, Danny, is joining us as well. Hello. There you go. All right. So let me gather my thoughts here. Um, wow. Yeah. So we just came from the theater. So this is totally fresh in my mind, seeing the film a second time. Uh, this is uh, Denis Villeneuve's uh, movie, uh, Blade Runner 2049. I, I think I pronounced his name right that time. Um, so he directed the film. It stars Harrison Ford returning as Rick Deckard. And then it stars uh, Ryan Gosling. A great supporting cast as well. Jared Leto, Robin Wright, Dave Bautista, um, etc. Um, first of all, I mean, number one, I mean, I love this movie. I'll give you my review soon. Um, but first of all, I want to kind of just give a little backdrop. Um, Blade Runner, the original film, which came out in 1982, is probably in my top 10, 20 list of movies of all time. Uh, and it's certainly in my top three science fiction films of all time. Uh, probably The Matrix and maybe Star Wars is all I would put ahead of that. And maybe Terminator 2. Um, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. Now, here's what's funny. Darn it, I said here's what's funny again, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I say that a lot on these uh, podcasts. Um, when Blade Runner came out, it's directed by uh, Ridley Scott. Um, that film, when it came out in 1982, um, was not well received by critics. Commercially, it did not do very well. And it is a film that really stood the test of time in the true definition of what a classic is. You know, over the last 30 years, and especially when that movie came to, like, home video, it grew and grew on its fan base, and now today it's considered one of the greatest science fiction movies of all time, which I totally agree with. Uh, Blade Runner, which is something I've always told my friends and other people as well, to me it's just so different than any other type of science fiction movie or you know in terms of its you know it's like a film neo-noir it's you know the futuristic dark uh, dystopian kind of atmosphere um, and also something I've always really appreciated with the original film is how each scene really takes its time and it, it builds up it's not it's not a wham bam action film at all um, now my wife hasn't seen the original, right? So nope. she hasn't, um, I've seen the original probably a hundred times, like literally. And here, here is, oh, darn it. Here's what's funny. <laughs> the funny thing is, yeah, the funny thing is, um, but this is true. I watched Blade Runner when it came out in 1982. Mm. Uh, that's crazy. I was like five or six years old. Yeah, you're old, we know. And I remember that movie from the, the first time I saw it. And I was a fan immediately. And that's crazy. I mean, I, I probably didn't even understand it. But then I watched it again and again. But I'm someone who's always been a fan from day one. I, I absolutely loved the movie. Um, and again, I'm talking a bit about the original Blade Runner just because it deserves its own kind of statement. It, it, it's an absolute masterpiece. Um, you know, it's based on a book by Philip K. Dick. Um, and it's just, it's so phenomenally done. Uh, part of what makes, to me, the, the original film Blade Runner 
such a masterpiece is the uh, the villain or the so-called villain, uh, uh, Roy Batty, played by Rutger Hauer. Um, he's incredible in that movie. He steals every scene he's in it, um, in that film. Um, and uh, of course, he delivers that incredible speech at the end. Any fan of Blade Runner knows what I'm talking about. The, the tears in the rain speech. You know, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. It's funny. I get really emotional talking about Blade Runner because <laughs> I, I love this film so much. The and man I, who did not cry on our wedding day gets emotional I, about Blade I did Runner. Not, I did like, not seriously. cry on our wedding day and I'm really not <laughs> thinking about Blade Runner. It's true, but you know, that's, I'm a true movie nerd. So there You're you such go. a lucky girl. I know. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you are. But anyway, okay, it's true. It's actually kind of embarrassing how uh, emotional that film gets me, especially that scene that, that, uh, the Rudger Hauer, who's a fantastic actor, um, you know, that's probably his greatest role, uh, Roy Batty. Uh, you know, the original Blade Runner basically is um, Harrison Ford plays Rick Deckard, who is like a um, LAP, LAPD uh, police officer who is a, called a Blade Runner. And what they do is they track down these replicants, which are basically like robots, but they look, feel human and everything like that. But they They're have synthetically extra, made. Synthetically made, yeah, yeah. But they have like extra superhuman strength. And it's in the future where they're used off-world uh, for like slave labor. So if you think about it, you know, the, the film is about him tracking down these four replicants who are, uh, you know, have gone back to earth and all they're actually trying to do is find out how to live. So they're not really villains in the truest sense of the word. I mean, obviously they murder the people coming after them and they murder a bunch of people on the ship when they escape. But, you know, these Blade Runners go out to quote unquote retire them, but they're essentially assassinating these, mm -hmm. you know, these synth synthetic beings, you know. Anyway, um, that film's incredible. And, uh, you know, it does, I would recommend seeing the original before watching Blade Runner 2049, because it is a true sequel. It's 30 years mm -hmm. later, but there are elements um, that absolutely follow them, you know, follow up to from the original one. Yeah, um, there's it, the same characters. Of course. It's a, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a continuation of the same storyline, but it definitely, this storyline could not exist without the original one. Exactly. So having not seen it, I'm going to And she hasn't guys, seen it, by the way. I'm going <laughs> to provide she did you guys with the Googled, other perspective. Yeah, what Danny did was she Googled uh, an article. No, it was article. just, it came up on my Facebook. Yeah, I didn't but you even looked Google at it. an article that said, if you haven't seen the original, what do you need to know before yeah, seeing Yeah, it's like if you haven't had time to rewatch it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, well then I don't care about spoilers because yeah. I'm going to go in. You know, to well, you could have rewatched it today when I was watching it before the movie. Yeah, but I didn't want to ever see it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had zero anyway. interest in seeing this movie. Yeah, Tony's so, like, please, will you go with me? And so like, God Fine. bless my wife for uh, coming out to see it with me tonight. And I actually think you did like it. I did. You know, um, it's but, the first movie I have not fallen asleep in in the theater. I can. I'm in a while, bad. I know. You I'm bad at asleep. movie theaters. Anyway, don't advertise that. This is Tony the movie guy. I said movie theaters. <laughs> okay, I love good. movies, but yeah. I like to be able to pause them and get up and get a glass of wine and not miss anything. Okay, good. So anyway, uh, the original Blade Runner is an absolute masterpiece. It's a fantastic movie, and um, it took 30 years. Um, but yeah, they they finally have uh, done a, a sequel, um, and I absolutely loved it. As I said, I saw it um, at the TCL Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard on opening night on one of the largest screens in the world, um, which was pretty profound, and I absolutely loved it. And I'll tell you, what was crazy was when I left, I, I hadn't really processed it yet. I mean, I was like, wow, that was good. But I was talking, I went with Trevor, my friend, who I cannot get to come on this podcast. <laughs> he says he's too shy. Damn you, Trevor. Anyway, we debate and talk about move, uh, you know, movies all the time. It would actually make for a fantastic podcast episode. So I'll probably like sneak a recorder in one day and like do it like in incognito. But anyway, um, but we were like talking about, we were like, wow, yeah, it was so good. But we started to kind of process it. You know, it's not a perfect film, but the, you know, the plot points that didn't work are, are so minor. But what was crazy was when I came home, when I came home, I started thinking about it more and it was still kind of percolating in my brain. And then I literally dreamt about the film all night. And then the next day, I had the, I know, my wife's looking, rolling her eyes like, you dreamt about a movie all night. The amount of embarrassment I feel right now. <laughs> no, it's true, man. And the next day I was, I couldn't get, I couldn't get the film out of my head. And to me, that's a really good sign. You know, I 
it, it just stayed with me. Mm -hmm. And then I downloaded the soundtrack from Hans Zimmer, which was phenomenal. And then I was, you know, listening to that on repeat because this is what I do. I'm Tony and the movie guy. Um, and then it was bringing back all the scenes to me. And it, I was like, wow, I have to watch it again. So then I, you know, begged my wife to see it with me again, which we just did. So um, I'm going to give this film four and a half out of five stars. Um, that's damn near perfect. I, I think this film will absolutely become a modern classic. You know, obviously we need to let it breathe and have more people see it. I will say this. I don't know that it's going to be a huge box office success and mm -hmm. big hit. I don't know that it will be because the original Blade Runner wasn't. I'm hoping it will do okay. Uh, it's a little dicey because they spent like $150 million to $180 million. That was the budget for the film. Um, it will open number one, but I think it will maybe do like $40, $50 million. I'm not even sure about it opening number one because Kingsman is still in theaters. And oh, it will definitely People open are still one. doing Kingsman. Oh, yeah. But no, no, the but thing it about... It will open number one. I'm still, I think it will be successful in the theaters, box office wise. I don't know if they'll be successful to the studio as far as return because they spent so much money on right. it. it was expensive. People will go see it. But since the first one came out and it wasn't a success and then it has such a home video following now and it's exactly. 35 years later, they had a re-release, what, at the 10-year anniversary of the director's cut and then um, 10 years after that yeah. had the final cut. Right? Well, that's what, one the other thing I was going to say. There are seven versions of the original Blade Runner, <laughs> you know, and I think I've watched four of them. Yeah, I've watched like seven four, total cuts. Seven versions, you know, they, there's so much to it. So I don't, who knows what there's going to be with this one. There might be other cuts. Um, I will say, I mean, this film is almost three hours long. I don't it, think there'll be other the, cuts of this one. But who knows, you know, when it comes out on iTunes and stuff, there'll be special features and so on. But uh, look, so it, it's a long movie. It, it clocks in just under three hours. So long. Yeah, and I will, yeah, but I will tell you that didn't bother me at all and here's why um this is not a wham bam thank you ma'am action film not it, at all yeah it's got some Which incredible like, what's that i like that actually about that. so did i and that's what i'm gonna kind of go into a bit more it's got some fantastic action sequences but it's it's a slow burn it's a think piece and it, it's an artistic movie and part of why this film works so well for me was it's not an exactly the same analogy but it's kind of similar to Star Wars The Force Awakens, where it paid homage to the original Star Wars so well. It was so nostalgic. Um, it was a great throwback. And at the same time, it introduced all these new characters mm -hmm. you actually could care about, like Rey and Poe. And, you know, and that made it you know, so entertaining. Now, obviously, it's not the same type of movie. It's not just like total you know, popcorn entertainment like Star Wars is. It's really, it's an artistic movie it's very aesthetic and it really gets you thinking about what does it mean to be human and uh, I, I found it very profound so i know i'm embarrassing my wife right now but it is but so let's talk a little bit about blade runner 2049 you want yeah. to say something no i was gonna say it is very profound it's because i'm i'm not a big action person and i'm not a big sci-fi person outside of star wars i love right. star wars but other sci-fi stuff i'm okay without yeah, that's um, true. You're not really big on that. And it's funny that you're not big on other sci-fi, but yeah, you love Star Wars. She Star shares Wars the same different. love of Star Wars that I do, but not other ones. That's funny, actually. Yeah, I'm not a big sci-fi person, but this felt like an art house film. Oh, it really was. Like the way it was shot, Yeah. the lighting, just the... Yeah, it was gorgeous. All the choices made technically made it feel like an art house film. And since it wasn't like this crazy action, 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 like shoot 'em up type action movie like it i don't know it kept me engaged without being slow and i, I think some people who aren't who, some people who see this i guarantee will be like it was so slow oh there were already a lot of people like oh it seems to be quite divisive some people like god it was so boring and other people like it was a masterpiece but if you like actually <laughs> look at it like not look at just what the characters are doing on the screen but look at the entire shot of yeah. whatever you're seeing like, there is constant movement. Yeah. There's two people sitting and talking. There's constant movement in the background with this beautiful light. I totally and all agree. all these different, and it totally sets the tone for the movie. Yeah. And it makes it so just stunning Yeah, to watch. and it really does. And I totally agree with you, babe, because I actually love that the director made the bold choice to take his time with each scene. And it's yes. got some very 
long, slow scenes mm -hmm. that you could see. If, you, if you're just trying to watch a Fast and Furious movie, this mm -hmm. is not the movie for you. Yeah, that's they it, like yeah. rush through dialogue and then get to the action scene. The action yeah. scene's going to last for 20 minutes. And then they're going to rush through some dialogue and just kind of like, oh, we need this thing. Oh, I have this thing. Right. I got it like a month ago. Great. Exactly. You know, like whatever. Yeah. So look, let me talk a little bit about the, the movie. So as I said, I'm giving it four and a half out of five stars. Five stars I consider like a classic, you know. That's um, like I, Schindler's List right Yeah, there. well, I actually don't like <laughs> Schindler's List. <laughs> that, that movie is notorious <laughs> with you now, babe. But anyway. That's um, why I mentioned it. See, five stars is kind of like an instant classic to me. And there's one thing that is true. It's a bit hard to call something an instant classic because the definition of a classic is something that has stood the test of time you know like 10 20 30 years later is it something you can still go back to and go wow it's amazing um but i think it's damn near at that point again only time will tell and we have to let it breathe a, a, a bit i've seen it twice already and i love it um so look a uh, blade runner in two, uh, 2049 it follows the original film 30 years later, mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to go too much into plot because it, it just came out, so I'm not going to give anything away. But uh, Ryan Gosling plays um, a, blade, a new Blade Runner called Kay, who discovers something that could basically change the course of you know, life on Earth and you know, the balance between replicants and humans. And, um, yeah, he the goes, social structure. Exactly. And he goes on a whole search for that, which uh, leads him to locating um, Rick Deckard, who's been in hiding for you know decades, which is played mm -hmm. by Harrison Ford. Uh, Jared Leto uh, plays this kind of sinister kind of corporate leader called uh, Wallace, mm -hmm. who basically he took over the Tyrell Foundation, which is from the original film. Who built they, the replicants they in the first place. They created the replicants, replicants in the first place. And in the first film... You've got the replicants uh, like Roy Bally, played by Rutger Hauer and Daryl Hannah and those different characters who they know they're replicants and they only have like a four-year lifespan. Mm -hmm. But then um, Rachel, played by Sean Young in the first film, is this Nexus 6. Eight. Uh, well, I think she's a Nexus oh. 6. These new ones are Nexus 8, mm -hmm. where basically they don't even know they're replicants. They actually think they're human because they have memories implanted in them. Well, they know they're replicants, but they, right. they have memories, so they're she more... She didn't. You oh, haven't seen well, the she, original. Yeah, film. but she didn't. Yeah. But she doesn't know these these yeah. ones now. Do. Yeah, so these new model Nexus eights. Um, so anyway, um, there's not much more I'm going to say about the plot. I will say, I mean, Ryan Gosling, I thought was uh, fantastic. Um, again, he he gave a subdued performance in this film. If you've seen Drive, you'll know what I mean. Mm -hmm. He gave a kind of similar performance to that, um, which I thought was perfect. And his discovery. And, you know, ultimately what happens with his character had the biggest effect on me. I thought it was beautiful and incredible. Yes. And then there's this absolutely gorgeous actress. I think she's Cuban called Anna D. Amos, who I haven't seen in much. She was in Knock Knock with Keanu Reeves. And uh, I think I've seen, she was in War Dogs. She played Miles Teller's wife in that film, War Dogs, with Jonah Hill. Oh. Um, absolutely gorgeous. She plays like a kind of like a computer image you know, of uh, his companion. It's, it's, she was fantastic. Yeah, in that, it's I the thought. same company. They have multiple different kinds of artificial. Uh, you know, they have it's the like replicants. AI, yeah. yeah, this is more like kind of almost like her, like but with a somewhat physical form as a yeah. hologram. Yeah, essentially. And yeah, yeah, and there's a love scene. Uh, this won't be giving something away, but there's a love scene in Blade Runner 2049 that involves a real life person and then Anna Diamas's holographic character and Ryan Gosling that I thought was absolutely stunning. Like a just surrogate in, body. Yeah, and how it was shot. I thought it was mm -hmm. it was just so beautiful and well done. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, and then like uh, the, the 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 special effects, the CGI and the special effects in this, I mean, they are so It's next level. It's art. They are yeah. so perfect. Yeah. Like it's usually art. I mean I could tell what was obviously special effects because yes holograms like that person is not a hologram they right. filmed her they made her look like a hologram yeah. um and there are certain parts where i know like oh 100 percent that is cgi but they it's it's like a oh my gosh you know it's like it's that difference between like really crappy cgi for like made for tv shows i'm proud of my whatever. wife right now very it's, much because she's really getting into this which is like me so that's good babe well i i appreciate <laughs> good filmmaking yeah, regardless fantastic. of the fact if i like the genre if i like the story whatever like s story aside 
that was a masterpiece technically. Absolutely. But I see technical Oscars for this. Maybe not in makeup or costume design, but definitely cinematography mm. and the special effects. The special effects are just... Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I'm gonna get, I'll get into that. Um, just in terms of uh, spotlighting some of the cast, um, like I was saying, uh, a- another person who I thought was fantastic in it, um, as I said, Anna Diamas. I wanted to kind of give a, a shout out to that actress because I thought mm-hmm. she was phenomenal. Um, and, you know, she's not so well known. And then there was a, a replicant who's like the you know, kind of the right-hand lady of uh, Jared Leto's like character. Her, his assistant. Yeah, the assistant, yeah. who's this, like, badass uh, Nexus 8. Uh, I think the actress is called uh, Sylvia Hoax. Again, I've never seen her before. I thought she was phenomenal. You didn't like her so much, but um, I mean, I, I didn't like her as much phenomenal. as the other characters. She's no Roy Batty. As I said, if there's anything that's missing from Blade Runner 2049 to make it an absolute classic, uh, it would be that, you know, that type of just absolute mesmerizing villain or mm-hmm. character that Rudger Hauer gave to uh, Roy Batty. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but outside of that, I actually thought this this lady did a really good job uh, playing this uh, Nexus 8 called Love. Um, you know, she was really badass. I love it when she's like, I'm the best one, you know. Yeah. But anyway, she was phenomenal. <laughs> and the supporting cast was great. And I told you this. So the first time I watched it, Jared Leto kind of bugged me a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I watched it Trevor again today. Trevor mentioned it too. Yeah, yeah. Trevor uh, said that too. But when I watched it again today, I actually appreciated his character and his scenes more. Again, it's not that he's evil, but he's kind of like, you know, he's he's playing God, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, I also really paid attention to his scenes because he has the more quieter scenes where he's really explaining things and there's dialogue so when Mm -hmm. i listened i actually got a lot more out of the storyline it's very Um, out of character for jared leto to play a more subdued character (laughs) it was very odd to watch but he was good in it so anyway yeah and i mean robin wright was actually very good she's like the boss of uh ryan gosling's the the lieutenant over the the lapd i thought she was really good uh dave batista um you know from he plays Drax in the mm-hmm. Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Mm-hmm. He's got a nice scene. It's quite small, but um, he, he's good in it. So a great supporting cast. Um, but yeah, what I was going to get to is I think what this this movie it has a crowning achievement in is directing, cinematography, and, and special effects. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely mind-blowing. I now, agree 100%. Yeah, so this this guy, Denis Villeneuve, he, uh, remember, we talked about him actually several episodes ago. I mean, he mm-hmm. did Sicario, which was fantastic. Didn't see Prisoners. It. And then didn't he did Arrival, which I actually didn't like very much. Didn't see it. Um, Wait, well, I did, but I did see Arrival, but yeah, I, I didn't like did it. Did I but see Prisoners? Which one was that? The Jake Gyllenhaal? Hugh Jackman, Jake Gyllenhaal. With yeah, the with kids? the kid going missing, Paul Dano. Oh, so Paul Dano. Oh, movie. I remember that one, yeah. Very yeah. gritty, but great movie. Anyway, so th- this guy is a very exciting director. Uh, mm-hmm. He did a phenomenal job but all the kudos go to roger deakins um who I, you won't know about this guy so much i'm a big movie nerd he's been nominated for an oscar like 13 times for cinematography for some he's a cinematographer yeah at uh, the cinematography okay. in this film is absolutely breathtaking every every scene is is a piece of art it truly elevates this movie to a whole new level and uh, you know it really p- pays homage to the original film, Mm -hmm. but it brings something fresh uh, fresh and authentic and totally unique on its own. I think you would agree, right? I 100% agree. And I think that if without him doing that, maybe not without him doing it, but, you know, either with someone else in his shoes or without just any of that, any of the cinematography and any of those, like, kind of background things that sets the tone for it, you would have hated this movie. Oh, I don't think so. But I think you I would have hated this movie. You would have been so disappointed. No, I don't think so. But um, I, I think mean, it he adds pays so homage much to, it. to the original. The original is as visually stunning. Look, again, Blade Runner, the first film, was way ahead of its time. People didn't get it. And the reason why Blade Runner 2049 works so well is because it takes, it pays such great respect to the original mm-hmm. while it has something totally new and original to say as well again i mean the script is fantastic the story is fantastic i you know the third act of this film is absolutely phenomenal i loved it i mean and look as i said i mean the first film is one of my favorites i you know i i would love this film no matter what but i think everything about it was um 
just such exceptional quality mm -hmm. and the cinematography is absolutely kind of the cherry on the top i mean mm -hmm. he i think he's a shoe in roger deakins will win an oscar i'm saying it right now i i guarantee he will he will win for this movie mm -hmm. yeah you can you can you can really tell when the people working on a particular project you know a movie music whatever it may be artistically when they're fans yeah you oh, know and they are exactly that's it's a like, good point it's actually. like jj abrams the star wars doing the star yeah. wars movie you can tell like he loves right. star wars yeah you know and i feel like the director the cinematographer loved blade runner yeah and that was the closest you know? comparison i can give even though they're a completely different type of movie it really, you know, we're Same gonna, scenario. Yeah, we're going to wrap this up, but um, that's kind of what I wanted to point out, you know, which I think is interesting in terms of a comparison is with The Force Awakens, you're totally right. Like J.J. Abrams, everyone involved in it had such respect and love and passion for mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the original trilogies and those films. They, you know, of course it had that nostalgia and it paid respect to that, but it brought something fresh and exciting and original. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what this film does. It, you know, it really, it, it stands on its own, but it's totally Blade Runner. And again, as I said, I watched it on opening night, then I re-watched uh, Blade Runner, the original, the, in final four, the final cut in 4K. And then because I'm crazy, I watched the three, four hour special features documentary in full in preparation for seeing the sequel again tonight. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Anyway, I loved every moment of it. I appreciate you uh, coming to see it with me. And, I loved uh, it too. Giving I mean, me support here. <laughs> I really was not wanting to go see this movie. And, and you liked then, it, right? But in you going in, you're like, it's fine. You're just going to fall asleep. I like, did. I thought she was just going <laughs> to sleep cares? on my shoulder. <laughs> like the last three films I've seen, she just fell asleep on my shoulder. <laughs> and she stayed awake and it's almost I three hours. I stayed awake during yeah. the whole thing. I only took one bathroom break, which is... <laughs> freaking impressive TMI, for me babe. all right well look we're I mean, gonna wrap this up but uh, look, but even uh, not having seen the original blade runner for those of you who maybe not ha don't have an interest in blade runner 2049 without have without seeing the original i've seen like a couple of scenes tony is like you have to watch this final scene like, in the rain man oh my god which i've I'd... seen things you people wouldn't believe yeah, and I play games on my phone when he shows me that. Don't say that. Um, I just don't have any interest. But without have seen the first one, now seeing this one and having no interest going in, I was engaged the whole time. I really enjoyed it. It helps if you have a backstory. And I did kind of have a backstory, but I didn't really know all of the ins and outs of the characters yeah. and all that in the yeah. storyline. But with like a very basic, like what from what Tony told you in the beginning, you can go in and see Blade Runner 2049 and I, I, I mean, unless you have like complete ADD and you cannot pay attention to art in front of you, I think you'll like this movie. <laughs> Absolutely. So look, here's my final kind of review on it. Uh, four and a half out of five stars. Um, exceptional um, achievement in direction, uh, script, uh, cinematography, mm -hmm. um, and especially also the music score from Hans Zimmer. So Absolutely good. beautiful. The sound um, editing was yeah, great it too. Was fantastic. Jesus. Solid acting. Um, but yes, again, I think for award season, this is going to be like best picture, best director. You think music. best picture? Oh, I think so. Oh, music really? um, and, you know, script and things like that. And again, a shoe in for cinematographer. But look, um, I highly recommend it. This is not your you know, run-of-the-mill popcorn action movie. So you will be disappointed if you just want, like, a, a pointless <laughs> kind of escape. Um, but if you want a smart, intelligent, engrossing film, you'll love it. And that's not to say it doesn't have action as a final anecdote. Uh, the action sequences, when they do happen, are fantastic, especially in, in the third act. Beautifully orchestrated. Yeah, I mean, and they're quite yeah. intense. And uh, anyway, it's just a fantastic film. I absolutely loved it, and uh, I really appreciate you coming to see it with me, okay? Yeah, I didn't completely hate going to the movies with you. Excellent. All right, <laughs> go see Blade Runner 2049. It's fantastic. Fantastic. It's a classic. Good night.
Thank you so much for listening to yet again another episode of Tony the Movie Guy, the podcast. We are very excited to bring them to you, so please follow us on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Tony the Movie Guy. Also, you can email us in questions, comments, concerns, whatever you'd like to Tony the Movie Guy podcast at gmail.com. And lastly, again, you hear me say it every week, please rate and review our podcast. Um, I believe you can only do this through iTunes, so if you have the app on your phone or if you have iTunes on your computer at home, um, either of those you know places, you can rate and review our podcast. That helps us get the podcast out to more people, which is what we want. We want to share this with the world. It's our passion, and we want everyone else to be able to hear it and enjoy it just like you do. So if you could do that, that would be amazing, and we'll see you next week for another episode. Bye-bye.